All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming today, for taking the time to uh, attend such a great conference like this. I uh, really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, hopefully, you're getting a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot of education so far out of the conference. Hopefully, I can continue on that track and bring a few more key ideas to you guys. Uh, you guys really are the elite of the industry. Uh, really only the best and brightest in any field will take the time and make the sacrifice to come to a conference like this. So uh, I applaud you for, for coming here in order to really build on your knowledge base and expand your skills when it comes to marketing in order to keep moving your business forward. I also want to take a, a quick second to thank the National Association of the Remodeling Industry for having me here. Uh, I am truly honored as well as humbled to be here. So as a student of history, uh, I was just recently reading a story, kind of a recounting from another author. Uh, it was a story about a young man uh, from a poor country. His name was Alex. And Alex was, was a little different from an early age. He really had a, a lot of ambition from an early age. And his ambition was to conquer the known world at the time except for there, there was a little obstacle in his way. Uh, the entire known world at that time was ruled by a nation state called the Persian Empire and King Darius. And if Alex was gonna fulfill his ambition, he was gonna have to take market share away from the market leader, who was gonna be very determined to hold on to it. So fast forward just a little bit through that story and young Alex did succeed in his quest and in doing so, changed the course of history. Uh, if this story sounds at all familiar to you, that young man is more aptly known today as Alexander the Great. The same situation exists for you all in the marketplace today. You're gonna have to take market share away from the market leader. In order to do that, you're gonna have to utilize all of your knowledge and marketing skills to win the marketing share battles of today. Now, winning those marketing share battles today is a little different from the battles that, that young Alexander faced. Uh, in today's world, really it comes down to your knowledge and your know-how when, when we're talking about digital marketing here. That's where the marketing share battles today will be won. Uh, you're gonna have to continually adapt your marketing strategies. You're gonna have to continually refine them and keep improving upon what you're doing, adapting to new platforms that are out there. As famous basketball coach Pat Riley once said, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. As I like to say, uh, not so famously I might add, is if your business is shrinking, then it's dying. And if your business is just kind of staying steady but not really growing, you're still dying. It's only when your business is growing that you are moving your business forward. Today, there, there are a lot of opportunities in the remodeling industry. I feel today there is no better time to be in the remodeling industry. Uh, sure, there's, there's going to be a little, you know, some hiccups along the way, but there's really no better opportunity right now to build your brand and showcase your company than we have with the internet right now. Uh, the ability to outshine your competitors is, is truly unparalleled, especially when you consider the old days of advertising and say like the yellow pages, that big fat yellow book that we used to transfer from our front porch straight into our recycling bin much different nowadays. And so we kind of wonder what does SEO have to do with, with winning marketing battles, with winning that, that uh, customer journey battle, in other words. Uh, today's digital marketing really comes down to the customer journey and how do you stand out uh, in that entire process of that customer journey from where they first see you online, they first heard about you, uh, and then they continually have those interactions all throughout that relationship with you. Um, this is what it really comes down to is, is figuring out the keys to success in winning that customer journey battle. 
And, and so we, we look at SEO, why does it matter at all in this customer journey? Uh, and for that matter, why does all of this internet stuff even matter at all? You're probably thinking, hey, I can just uh, keep getting referrals, uh, keep growing my company that way, um, maybe just keep uh, counting on your five-star reputation to keep you elevated in people's eyes. But uh, that's kind of keeping things steady. That's not really going to keep growing your company. At some point, you got to start winning those marketing battles. Kevin Costner uh, in the movie The Field of Dreams, when he said, build it and they will come, he was wrong. Because you can spend thousands of dollars on your website and still be listening to the sound of crickets as you wait for profits and sales to magically scale to the moon. Uh, the issue here is that your competitors simply have a better digital marketing strategy than you do. And that's what it comes down to is really shining on Google, getting onto that page one of Google in order to bring in more online visibility. Uh, and that's what it's all about really, is more online visibility brings in more sales, uh, more, more calls are coming in, more design consults are being said, and ultimately you're growing your revenue. And so when we talk about winning those marketing share battles today on Google particularly, um, we're really talking about how do we adapt to what Google wants. And, and in Google's world, they're always changing the algorithms, always making you pivot and, 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 and weave and, and bob through their whole algorithm. Uh, one, one second it's, it's your reputation, another time they want more blogs, more backlinks, on and on it goes. Um, the latest algorithm update with Google that we've just seen roll out over the past year or so has to do with content. And in Google's world, uh, the mantra is and always has been content is king. And so when we're talking about content, uh, right now people are starting to shift their marketing strategies. How do they adapt to this new algorithm? What is really uh, Google striving for here in terms of that content. Uh, and it really boils down to um, how do you satisfy Google's hunger? Um, and not coincidentally, it has to do with eating, E-E-A-T uh, -E to be specific, um, ex experience, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. This is what Google is looking for nowadays. This is what's gonna have the biggest impact for you. So when we talk about experience, does the content creator have firsthand experience at the topic uh, that they're talking about? And then expertise, what is your level of expertise, knowledge, and skill when it comes to the subject matter? Authoritativeness, is the reputation of the author or the website a reliable source of information on that subject matter. And then trustworthiness. The usefulness of your content will come down to the accuracy, honesty, safety, and reliability of that content. This is what Google's looking for nowadays. This is what's gonna get you ranked in the search engines, is putting out great content that satisfies these for qualifications. It's no longer about he who has the most backlinks wins. It's really about who's putting out the best content out there that really is relevant, that Google can say, hey, this author, this website, this company, this brand, they are providing information that's real and it, it satisfies their new algorithm demands. Um, and, and it's not AI generated, where everyone is kind of doing that now. Not to say that AI generated content is bad, but you have to use that as a springboard. Use it for ideas and then start uh, putting your own touch into that content. If you're just going to ChatGBT or one of these other AI content generators and, and taking what they spit out to you and then slapping it on your website, 
that's not going to get you very far. These are, these are robots, after all, writing us, right? They, they don't, they're not you, the people with experience, with that expertise. And the way that AI generated that content was based on just reading thousands of web pages, basically plagiarizing stuff. So at some point, there's going to be a shakeout coming uh, in, the, in the world of AI-generated content. So don't go too deep down that rabbit hole. Keep thinking about how can you be the expert? How can you generate content that people really like based on, say, questions that your customers have? You all get questions over and over throughout the course of a year, throughout the course of your careers. Write content about that that addresses those questions, and that's going to be more relevant. That's going to be what people are looking for. It's going to get more engagement. People are going to spend more time reading your content, more time on your website, and then Google's going to start thinking about looking at those metrics and, and seeing that, wow, okay, we're getting more engagement with this website as opposed to other websites that don't really get that engagement, especially those just lathered in AI content where people can see, hey, see through that AI content and say, wow, you know, I, I'm just not going to read this. This really isn't that relevant. How does all of this really shake out when we're talking about the customer journey? Uh, it's really about understanding that customer journey, uh, all the steps that the customer goes through in the discovery process to all the interactions they have with you, and really making sure that every, every representation of your company every step along the way in that customer journey is exactly how you want the customer to be seeing you. And so how do we do that? It's first by understanding the, uh, the framework of that customer journey. There, there are three steps to the, to the customer journey, three big phases, in other words. Uh, first is prospecting. Uh, this is where the customer is just looking for your services. They're just starting to, to fish around. They're starting to, to look through different websites, social media. They're just starting to, to get a feel for who's out there, what's out there. And then the second stage, once they're um, aware of you, is now converting them. Uh, how do you bring that customer into your ecosystem? How do you get them digesting some of your content and interacting, engaging with you and your brand? And then the last stage is advocacy. And that is really about turning all of your customers into raving fans that, that will shout your name from the mountaintop, basically, is what we're looking at. So uh, let's start with the first phase in prospecting. Uh, the first component of that prospecting phase is awareness. Where are they seeing you at? Are they seeing you um, in, in uh, uh, is it online, is it offline, uh, is it social media, is it your websites? Where are they really seeing you at? And then engagement. How do you get them to start interacting with your brand? And the last component is the opt-in. What can you offer them in order to get them engaged and get them to follow you to, in order to stay uh, top of mind with them? So let's talk about awareness first. Where are they seeing you at? Uh, is it on social media, sites like Facebook and Instagram, uh, perhaps even LinkedIn? Uh, or is it in Google search? Uh, are you ranking on maps or maybe you're ranking in organic search or maybe you're running Google home service ads, pay-per-click ads. In other words, they're going to Google and they see you on page one of Google, maybe multiple places uh, where you're owning as much digital real estate as you can. And then also offline, maybe it's uh, yard signs that you're putting out there. Maybe it's your wrapped uh, vehicles that they see traveling through the neighborhood. So there's a lot of opportunities for them to start to be aware of you, whether it be online or offline. And then engagement, how do you get them to engage with your brand? In other words, how do you get them to raise their hand to say they want to interact with you? Maybe they want something. Uh, is it the blog and educational articles that you're writing? Again, we're not talking AI content here. We're talking real stuff that you guys go through on a daily basis that you can teach them about and make sure that you steer them in the right direction based on your experience, based on uh, design and functionality and things that you guys know intimately about. 
Uh, maybe it's uh, video platforms out there. Maybe you're doing videos, putting those on YouTube or TikTok. Videos that really truly showcase your expertise and your craftsmanship. Video is, is as important as it can possibly be nowadays. It's how you can stand out from your competitors. And then maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's those stories that you're sharing on Facebook, the posts you're making, maybe videos you're putting on there uh, on Facebook if you're doing the, the shorts, the, the one minute videos. Um, I will say one thing about video. Uh, YouTube is the second most traffic search engine in the world. So it's something that you don't want to ignore. I know a lot of people don't like to do videos. They think, oh man, I, I'm not me. I'm, I, I, I'm not good on camera. I, I've got a face for radio maybe. Um, the, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're basically self-defeating thoughts that, that tell you why you can't do it. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get my iPhone out and I'm gonna film it, I'm just gonna go for it. Um, no one started out as an expert making videos. At some point, everyone starts with that very first video that might look a little clunky. Um, maybe you gotta memorize some things, but the more and more you do it, the better you're gonna get. So I just really wanna stress for you all to be thinking about videos and, and how can you showcase your expertise in those videos. Again, answering those questions that people have. You know those questions they always have. Do a short video. Maybe you do a video when you're out on a project site. Um, those work great. They, those are what gonna engage people, draw people in. They're gonna think, oh, what, what are they building here? What, what more can I learn here that might be applicable to them and the project that they uh, have in mind for you? And then opt-in marketing, uh, this is where we're getting them to, to raise their hand and say they want something from you. Um, this could be a newsletter, a, say a monthly newsletter that you're doing on a, on a monthly basis, maybe every couple weeks if you're really, um, really wanting to write a lot, if you've really got a lot of great content. But monthly is, is surely going to um, suffice to start with. Uh, or maybe you've really got your email marketing dialed in. Email marketing, this is again, you can be talking about uh, tips and tricks, educational kind of topics. Uh, maybe you're sharing before and after pictures, uh, a, a project you're working on, and so you send that in an email. Hey, we're working with, with Dave and Debbie on their new dream kitchen. Uh, just got the uh, granite installed, just got the cabinets installed. Kind of walk them through that story. You want them to be able to read that email and, and kind of really get into that story and then start seeing themselves in their own story that they can create with you. And then the, the, the next stage, that next phase is really converting them. How do you bring them into your ecosystem? How do you start uh, engaging with them and start opening those conversations? They're now they're past looking and they're starting to go, okay, now I wanna start talking to some designers, some remodelers, some contractors, and start moving the ball forward. And so what you're looking for here is, how do you get commitments from them? How do you get them into your pipeline, in other words? And then excitement, how do you generate an aha moment, uh, a moment of, of, of a wow factor that they, that they know that they've found the right person, the right company to be working with. And then lastly, uh, ascension, are there multiple tiers to your sales process? So let's break those down. Uh, first, with conversions, uh, we're talking about calls to action here. Calls to action on your website, uh, schedule a consult or call us now. Those are your simple calls to action. Um, but what we're trying to get them to do is to make that phone call. That's the ideal scenario, right, is, is to make that phone call. So uh, make sure that you have a real live person answering the phone. Um, Make sure it's someone that is trained in sales, that has a sales methodology that they're working from. A lot of folks um, get into business and they, they come up through the ranks in business. They don't come from sales. 
Uh, they, they start swinging a hammer early on. They start wrenching uh, pipes uh, underneath sinks, and then they start their own business. Uh, the thing that's missing there is that sales component because no matter how good you are, no matter how great your quality, your craftsmanship is, you still need to sell. You still need to convince that customer to work with you. So make sure you're working off a sales methodology framework. Uh, make sure you have a salesperson answering the phone. You don't want uh, random people in your office, office admins, things like that answering your phone uh, that might just kind of be winging it every time. You really want to go through, not necessarily a script, but kind of a script to where you're asking the right questions, you're going through that discovery process with them and getting to the information that you're looking for so that you can help walk them through that phase. And then also uh, you might have web forms. Uh, that is another way that people are starting to interact more with websites right now. A lot of people don't like to pick up the phone um, in order to, to, to really get that conversation started. They'd rather just you know slide into that web form, submit that, let you reach back out to them. Um, so make sure you have a web form on your website. I see a lot of websites that they only have that contact page. That's the only place that you can find a web form. Um, you need that on every page of your website. Uh, the whole idea is to make it easy for them to contact you. Don't make them click more or navigate through your, your site structure any more than they have to. Every extra step that you ask them to do, every extra click, is going to cut down on your conversions. That's proven in marketing time and time again. It doesn't matter if we're talking remodeling or any kind of marketing. The more you ask of them, the more you ask in your web form, Phil, if you're asking 10 different questions instead of just getting a name, phone number, and an email, the more questions you ask again cuts down on those conversions. Sure, you would like to know, like, what's their, uh, you know, what type of project are they, are they looking to do? What's that price range? Uh, when are they looking to do it? These are all questions that you want answers to, right? But better yet is to get on the phone and have that conversation to get those answers. Because a lot of people, they don't want to put all that information down. Again, you're just cutting down conversions. And then um, having a, a calendar scheduling function might be helpful too. Having that on your website, uh, Google business page profiles also have uh, scheduling functions. And this isn't necessarily meaning you're scheduling a design consult at their home because you're thinking right now, well, Bob, maybe they don't, they've got a $5,000 budget for their bathroom and, and we know that you can't even buy the materials for that. So why would I wanna let them schedule on my calendar and go out there and find this out? That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about getting that phone call scheduled because usually with those web forms, you, they submit those and then, you're, and then you're chasing them down. It's really hard to get a hold of them after that. So this is just a way where you can get a phone call scheduled uh, that works for everybody. And the last thing that, that kind of goes with the web forms, but it's quite different, uh, are chat widgets. Uh, chat widgets are becoming more and more popular. You don't see them as much in the remodeling field, uh, in building and construction, as you say, uh, with, with plumbing maybe, or air conditioning, where they're just like, ah, oh, my air conditioner's out, it's the end of the world, I need somebody now. Um, but you are gonna see more and more chat widgets, chat interactions, mainly because of the demographics that we're starting to deal with now. The younger generations, the new homeowners that are starting to come into, the, into your guys' ecosystem right now, they don't like to, to, to get on the phone as much as we do. They want to have a quick chat. They want to send you a text and get the ball rolling that way. So the key here is, is to think about all the different demographics, all the different people that you guys interact with, and just make sure that you have options available for every person, no matter what type of interaction they want to have with you, you've got it covered. And, and when we're talking about chat widgets too, make sure that if you're using a chat widget, that it's tied into your phone, your email, your Facebook messenger. Don't use a chat widget if you're not going to pay attention to it. There's nothing worse than going into a chat, asking that question, and then crickets. There's no one really on the other end of that line. Um, that's the worst user experience that a person could have when they come to a website. And that's really what it's all about, is user experience, uh, what we call UX. 
Uh, that's what Google's looking at. They want to see how people are using a website, what kind of interactions they're having, how many pages they're going to. Are they scrolling on that page? These are all things that make for a good user interaction. A bad user, uh, user experience is going to be a chat widget with no one on the other end of the, of the phone, of the, uh, of the chat. And there are companies that, that run these for you too that will answer for you in chat. Um, there are companies with answering services. If you guys are out in the field a lot and you can't get on the phone, um, you're, you're in meetings, you're on job sites, you're with project managers, whatever it may be, use an inexpensive answering service. Nothing uh, will save a call, possibly a job, maybe even a big job, by having a real live person on the other end of that that phone answering that can handle your call, even an answering service. You have a nice scripts, you can at least get some information because a lot of people don't use, they don't leave voicemails these days. They just, they don't you know, have the attention span for it. The average attention span for human beings nowadays is about seven to eight seconds, about the same as a goldfish. So um, you really got to think about these things. There's a lot of psychology going on here. It's not just remodeling homes, right? Um, but you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And so make sure that first impression is not your voicemail prompt or a chat that goes nowhere. So when we talk about converting, conversion rate optimization uh, and user experience, there's so much that can go into that. When we're talking about people coming to your website, how well optimized do you have that website for user experience? Um, first thing, do you have that phone number up in the right hand corner? That's where everyone's used to looking for it. So this really isn't the time to be cute and put it somewhere else. Oh, I think I'll do it up in the left or maybe I'll put it all the way at the bottom where they can't find it. Um, they got to scroll all the way down there. Um, again, just do what people are used to. You're trying to get the engagement in the easiest way possible. So make sure that phone number is in the upper right where they look for it. Make sure it's click to call so that they can call right from their mobile device. More people access the internet these days from their mobile devices and mobile tablets than they do with desktop computers. That's why Google puts such a heavy, heavy emphasis on sites that are mobile friendly, mobile optimized. Uh, you got to make sure that you're using the tools that Google puts out there. Uh, you can go to Google and put in Google mobile friendly tool or Google page speeds insights tool. Um, these will tell if your website is mobile friendly or not. It will show what your website looks uh, in a mobile rendering and it will tell you what errors it's having or their page speed insights tool will tell you how quickly your pages are loading or what we often see how slowly they're loading. Again, think attention span of a goldfish. If your site is loading super slow, these people are gonna bounce right back into the search results and they're gonna find another website that's gonna serve up a better user experience for you. And Google's gonna see that. Google's tracking all of these metrics. It knows what keyword you use to get to a, uh, that search query to get to that website. It knows how long you went on that website. It knows what pages you went to, how long you spent on each page. Did you scroll or not? Um, did you watch a video? How much of the video did you watch? All of these things Google is tracking and all of that is all about user experience. So uh, this is really key. Uh, also your, your navigation menu. I see this time and time again where people offer all kinds of services. So you do kitchens and you do bathrooms and you do basements, maybe you do full home renovations, maybe you're doing additions maybe restoration projects, roofing, whatever. You have a whole list of services that you offer, but yet you don't have a page for each of those services. You just have a, a services and then you have one page. It kind of says, we do all of this stuff and we have this great design process and we have this great uh, customer service and all this stuff, but you're not really telling people about those services and how you approach each one of those services. And better yet, what, what you're telling Google about those services. If you don't have a page for say uh, home additions, how do you expect to get ranked for home additions? 
Google's looking at your website thinking, why would I rank this website for a service I can't even find on here? There was one mention of it somewhere, stuck in between kitchens, bathrooms, and basements. Like, that's not gonna do it. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you have pages for every one of your services. Typically 500 words or more is what Google's looking for. Try to break that up with lots of pictures, lots of different widgets, functionality, calls to action, a lot of things that you can put in there. Uh, and then uh, your, your portfolio pages. Uh, have lots of portfolio pages, not just one portfolio pages. Uh, you're, you're really trying to showcase all of your work, all of the great uh, quality you're putting out there, quality craftsmanship, um, what kind of designs, uh, what kind of uh, innovation are you guys bringing to the market? Uh, are you doing the same old, same old? Uh, or are you guys really doing some cutting edge stuff that you can showcase, all kinds of different styles? Um, you want to have portfolio pages that match each of those services. You don't want to throw everything into one portfolio page. One, it's, it doesn't provide for the best user experience because now people got to sift through all that stuff to find what they were looking for. And then also, that page is going to load really, really slow because of how many pictures you've got on there. So if you're doing kitchens, have a kitchen portfolio page, bathrooms, another page for bathrooms, another page for basements, on and on it goes. That's really key. Uh, another thing is those before and after pictures. Make sure that you're taking before and after pictures because uh, we all get enamored with that, uh, that final product and you look at it and think, wow, that is beautiful. But a lot of people, they wanna know what it looked like before you started. Um, people are very visual, and so it really helps them uh, to, to tell a visual story. This is where the project started, and this is where it ended. And, and by doing that, they can see the evolution of that. And also making sure that you're taking those pictures from the same exact vantage point, so that they can, they're not trying to figure out, how did that kitchen become this kitchen? Same exact angle. And then you can also use a, a cool little slider tool um, on, that you see on some websites nowadays. We do this. It's, it's where you combine those two pictures into one. It's got a slider that you can slide back and forth. And so you can kind of play with that. And, and people love that. It, it, it's a toy, basically, and people like toys. Um, and, and you slide that, that slider back and forth, and you can see that evolution back and forth, back and forth. And people love that. We get a lot of compliments on that um, from the websites we build. It's just such a neat feature. Again, people are very, very visual. So you want to help bring them into that story. Let them think about how you can create that same story for them as well. Uh, Google Map Embeds, everyone wants to rank on Google, right? We talked about Google Maps a little bit there. Uh, that's where a lion's share of the phone calls come from. So make sure you put that Google Map Embed in the footer of your website so that it shows up on every page. Now Google knows, okay, this website, this Google business page, these are all linked together. Um, Google really wants to see that. People want to see that and see, oh, okay, I see where you're at, just you know, around the corner, you're within my area, whatever it may be. So there's a lot that we can talk about when it comes to website optimization. Uh, I don't want to go too deep down that rabbit hole. I might end up being here three hours and then Chris will kick me out of here, never invite me back. Um, I've already got a gentleman here in the front row yawning, so we, if we go too far down that rabbit hole, <laughs> he may keep yawning on me. <laughs> One thing I'd wanna talk about too is, is SEO and Google Maps marketing. As I said, uh, Google Maps is typically the lion's share of the phone calls. Uh, anywhere from uh, 50 to 66%, so we're looking at half to two thirds of the phone calls are going to those Google Maps rankings. That was top three uh, on page one, what we call the three pack. It used to be seven companies a long time ago, now it's down to three. So it's getting harder and harder to rank in that three pack. Uh, but that's where a lot of the phone calls are coming from. Those review ratings on there, those gold stars on there, that's really, again, a visual element. Uh, not only does it pop out visually, but then you have that little number that says 5.0, five star reputation. Yeah, this is the company I wanna work with. They may not even go to your website. We see that quite a bit where 
a call will generate strictly from the Google page. They haven't even visited your website yet. Maybe after they talk to you, they'll go look at your website, they'll start looking through your portfolio, your before and after pics, all that. Um, but a lot of people will just see that review rating and think, God, five-star reputation, 50 reviews, 75 reviews. This is a company, I'll, I'll talk to them. I'm gonna call two or three different contractors, remodelers anyways, so why not give them a call because they've certainly earned that reputation. So make sure that you're really paying attention to your Google business profile. Um, there's not a lot you can do on there, but there's some important things you can do on there, such as uploading photos on a regular basis. A lot of folks aren't doing that. Uh, that's how you engage with that platform. And again, this is a Google property, so they want more engagement. They want you using their tools, their, the things they build out there, YouTube, Google Business Page, Google Sheets, and uh, Google Drive, uploading PDFs of your project, all kinds of things like that. But uh, uploading your photos is a really big one because ideally you're uploading those photos from the job site. And that's important because Google knows where you're at. It knows the location of that phone when it took those photos on that job site. And so now you've created a scenario where, where Google said, oh, you were in this neighborhood with these photos. All that neighborhood data, that latitude, longitude, GPS data is embedded in that photo right there on your iPhone. And so Google knows that that's where you were now Google knows you have experience at that, at that topic, whatever that might have been, a kitchen remodel. You have uh, expertise of, of, of that topic and you have been in that neighborhood. So now they're looking, thinking, okay, if someone's looking for a remodeler in this neighborhood, well, look right here. This Google page has those photos with that embedded data in it. So really important um, to think about how you're uploading photos uh, as well as renaming those photos if you can. Um, so that it says, you know, kitchen remodeling Las Vegas instead of image 9024. Um, you know, you want to tell Google all you can about that photo. You can do that in like Photoshop. You can really change up a lot of that metadata there. Uh, make sure your hours are accurate. Your phone number is on there. I just had a call from a young lady a couple days ago wondering why her Google page wasn't ranking anymore. She didn't even have her phone number on there. Um, that's going to really cut down on phone calls to your business. <laughs> Trust me. Um, and then, uh, you know, making sure your website's on there, changing your hours, you know, uh, if you got holidays, things like that. Uh, don't set your hours to 24 hours either. Uh, you're probably not open at 2 a.m. to take a remodeling call, I'm pretty sure. Um, you do it to try to get ranked, but uh, in the end, Google knows that you're kind of gaming the system. And so don't game the system. Google will always sniff that out. Uh, gaming the system will get you dropped in the rankings quicker than anything. So um, always kind of make sure you're doing things the right way. Google best practices, what they're looking for. But there's a lot that you can do with Google Maps to really make that work for you. The Google post, the Google business post that you can put on there and then you can link those posts to the topic on your website, link it to that kitchen remodeling page or to that bathroom remodeling page, link it to a new blog post that you've put out, um, back and forth, you can, you can interlink these things so that Google sees it all tying together. It's really about creating synergy amongst as many things as you can, uh, whether it be Google properties or whether it be uh, your website, your blogs, uh, press releases you're putting out there. Um, that synergy creates a lot more momentum for you. Something about the, the sum of the parts being greater than the whole, I think is how that saying goes. And then, and then how do you create excitement? Um, how do you create excitement for, the, for that customer to, to get that wow moment? Uh, is it through those pictures, those, those pictures that just went from god-awful 70s kitchen to something that just looks absolutely beautiful? Um, exquisite details, exquisite cabinets, granite, whatever it may be. Um, you really want to uh, make sure that they come to your website and go, wow, like this is, this is nice. I, you know, I've heard people say that they've gotten jobs before just from their website design alone. Uh, people really enjoy 
coming to a nice website, not something that was, that was built by your, your eight-year-old niece um, you know, eight years ago. Um, there, you know, it's going to look a little dated, it's going to look a little boring, and it's not really going to impress people. So you really think about how can I create a wow factor, that aha moment where they say, wow, this is, this is someone I can see myself working with. I really like the work I'm seeing here. Maybe you've had a great wow conversation with them where you just blew them away with your knowledge. Um, you've educated them on uh, you know, what projects will look like, timelines, cost, everything going on today with our cost factors, costs going up and, and everything that, that maybe people aren't aware of. So uh, really try to come, come strong with that wow factor. Um, your portfolio can do that as well. Well, and this is where you can really showcase your expertise, your quality craftsmanship, all the innovative designs you're doing, uh, as well as your um, before and after pictures, pictures that you're putting on Instagram. People love Instagram. People, again, love that visual storytelling. So make sure that you're putting your pictures out there, Facebook, Instagram, uh, anywhere you can. Um, and, and when we talk about Facebook, I'm not talking about going on there and, and doing before and after pictures with every single post that you do. That's not gonna get engagement. Um, that's Instagram, put all your photos on there. That's, that's what Instagram is for. It's a photo sharing platform, basically. Uh, Facebook is more about interactions, about engagement. So you can do some of that uh, before and after, but for Facebook, the way you can have the most success is doing video. If you're not getting enough engagement on your Facebook page, you're not getting enough likes, enough comments, you feel like whatever you're doing on social media, on Facebook, is just not working, maybe try video if you're not doing that. And that's where you're going on there. Again, you're talking about um, tips and tricks and answering questions that they have. Video converts at about eight times the rate of content. So people are gonna watch those videos. Uh, it's the whole reason why cat videos go viral. People will rather watch videos and then just look at posts, read content, read page after page. So really something to think about, um, creating that wow factor through your pictures, through your portfolio, through the work you're doing, in other words. And then Ascension, um, this is really talking about um, how do you get micro commitments from them? How do you um, go through a tiered system? Uh, and the most obvious example of that tiered system is a design build agreement. Uh, with the design build agreement, you first have the design component of that. That's all you're really contracted to do. That's what that agreement is talking about is designing the process, going through that whole process, that, that creating that vision for them, uh, and then finishing that design up. And at that point, that's when you talk about, okay, now do we take that next step? Do we go to the second phase, uh, which is the build agreement? Um, not everyone does it this way. It's not necessary for you to do it this way. You don't have to have a tiered system of working with clients, a two-step system like a design build agreement. It's not necessary, um, but it does give you an advantage in that you can get two smaller commitments instead of one big commitment because with that design, you get to work with them and really showcase who you are and really build that relationship, hopefully a relationship that will last a long time. And then they go, wow, yeah, I'm, I'm all in on this, on this build, uh, as opposed to um, putting it all together and they're not really sure if they wanna make that big of a commitment yet. The last step uh, is advocacy. Uh, this is uh, broken down into uh, making your customers raving fans of yours, shouting your name from the mountaintop that they're so happy working with you. Uh, and then promoters. Uh, these are the folks that are gonna generate referrals for you. So let's talk about the raving fan first. Making customers your biggest fans uh, really comes down to really making the experience for them the best experience that they could possibly have. Um, not only a raving fan when it comes to the project results that you generated for them, um, but really the relationship that you built throughout the process as well as that five-star standard of customer service that you offer. 
So there's a lot that goes into that. And, and this is really that customer journey encapsulated again, because every step along the way of the customer journey is the potential to get that five-star review at the end of the project or the potential to derail that and not get that five-star review. So it's how they see you online. Where are they seeing you? What are they seeing you? What are they reading uh, on your post? Um, what kind of interactions are they having with your company? Um, and that starts from that very first phone call that came in to the entire process all the way through the, 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 the worker bees that come out on the job site, how they treat them, how they treat uh, the, their home and, and wearing booties and, and looking out for the dog and things like that. Um, from the, the blog articles you write and the educational articles that get them more educated in terms of what's going on with the whole process. How communicative are you in terms of being clear on the timeline of the project? How communicative are you in terms of talking about supply chain issues and, and why things are taking longer? Um, there's a lot of that going on, so making sure that you are out in front of that is really key. That's how you get those five-star reviews. Uh, and, and the more five-star reviews you get, the more new potential customers will see themselves in that same story. They read those reviews word for word like I do, and then they think, wow, I, I can see myself having that same experience as these folks did. Um, so again, you're painting that picture. Uh, and the more reviews you get, of course, the better off you're gonna be in Google's eyes and probably rank a lot better as well. Uh, all things being equal, he who has the most reviews typically ranks better if everything else is all the same. And bad reviews even um, help rankings too, but we definitely don't want those. And then um, when we talk about these testimonials, um, making sure that you're, you're thinking about those every step of the way, um, every interaction, that's what's gonna get you that review. But don't be afraid to ask either. Um, not everyone is just a review writing machine. They don't think naturally at the end of a project, oh, I, I, I gotta go, man, I gotta get to Google to go write that review for you. Can you get off my porch? I, you know, it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that quickly. Um, you wanna plant seeds along the way, maybe early in the project. You say, hey, if we do a really good job and you're really satisfied, would you mind sharing some feedback on Google for us and, and letting folks know um, the experience that you had? Uh, that's how you plant a seed. That's not in your face. That's not saying, hey, can you write me a review? Um, that's asking for online feedback, a big distinction um, and, and a way to plant that seed. And then you can, you can plant those seeds throughout the process too. Uh, when, you, when you're out and, and you've just done a phase of the job and that customer is super happy with what they're seeing, that's an opportunity. That's what we call a review moment right there. Like, oh wow, like, I'm glad you like that. I'm glad that's really working out exactly the way you wanted. You, like you're gonna write about that and when you write some feedback for us, right? And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, this is gonna be my favorite part. So you're helping them along. Again, not everyone uh, writes reviews and they certainly don't know how to write them uh, in a way that will best uh, serve your needs by using you know, keywords, really going into detail. You see some of those reviews that say, oh, you know, great job. And you're like, well, okay, it's a five star, but I wish it would have been like three paragraphs worth of good stuff. So um, you can really help them in that process as well. And then following up with them after the project's over um, to make sure that, that they had a great experience. Remember, it's not about the review. It's about the experience they had and the review will come from that. And then the last stage uh, in this long customer journey that we've went on is, is them promoting your services. And or, in other words, they've been so happy with the experience that they had you, with you, the, the results you've generated, this beautiful dream kitchen maybe that you've built for them, that they're gonna be referring you any chance they get. Um, they're gonna tell their friends and family about you. Uh, they're gonna have their neighbors over to show off their, their new project. Uh, in general, these folks are gonna become your best form of advertising. Uh, and when, when you're talking about referrals, it is the best form of advertising because it's free advertising.
Last thing I want to talk about, um, Brian touched on this uh, earlier today, um, is company culture. Uh, we, we've all heard a lot about, you know, culture within a company, um, but every interaction that you or your team members have with a customer is going to come down to the culture that you created for those employees of yours, and that's going to really define how those interactions unfold in that in that customer relationship. So, um, when we think about it. Does your company really have culture built into it? Are you really developing that? And, and so the first thing is to determine, do you have a company culture? Do you legitimately have a company culture, a culture that everyone on the team knows about uh, and they know what your mission statement is? Do you even have a mission statement? Does everyone, uh, are they on board with that mission? Do they know what your company core values are? Uh, do they know what your company goals are from year to year? Your mission statement is what tells your employees, your team members, why you exist as a company. And your company core values tell them how you work and who you are. And so you really want to make sure that you've shared this with your entire company and then you've got buy-in uh, when it comes to company culture. Uh, in our company, for example, we read our company mission statement and our company core values every week in a team meeting and a different person is chosen each week to read those. Uh, it's really important for, for building a foundation, just like a house needs a solid foundation from which to stand. Your company also needs a strong foundation uh, for it to succeed and prosper. And that foundation starts with culture. Um, so again, just make sure you have buy-in on this. Remember, you guys aren't here just to remodel homes. You're here to foster and nurture a team of dedicated individuals, uh, folks that are, are genuinely happy working within your company uh, and collaborating together. Uh, and, and it's your job to really be thinking about how you can bring out the best in everyone. Um, other things to think about when it comes to culture is making sure that you, you're always um, fostering uh, relationships, open communication with everyone. Uh, keep those communication channels open so that you can kind of get a, a, a whiff of trouble brewing ahead of time, maybe detecting burnout or, or other issues that, that you might see coming. Um, you want to be able to, to uh, hold near and dear to your heart the, the mental well-being of your staff uh, making sure that, that, we're, that we're paying attention to, to an, an issue that doesn't, uh, unfortunately, get as much attention as it, does, as it should these days, uh, mental health. So uh, make sure you're aware of that so that you're creating a, a team of, of happy, thriving individuals. Company culture is not a set it and forget it exercise. It's something that must be continually grown and nurtured. Uh, in order for you to have a, a happy team. So uh, always making sure that your, your team members, your employees feel valued and they feel respected. Uh, making sure you have great training and support mechanisms in place. Um, it, it comes with the, uh, the, the company benefits that you offer. Uh, so there's a lot that you can be doing uh, on, a, on a consistent basis to make sure you're building that company culture and it has to be consistent. Uh, the work is really never done here when it comes to culture. So make sure you're keeping it positive, uh, you're keeping it fun, and see what kind of results you get from your efforts. Uh, most importantly, see what kind of results you see within your team members in terms of team happiness, uh, maybe boosted productivity, uh, lower turnover weight, uh, rate, and, and in general, a, a team of people working together, collaborating together, working toward that common set of goals. Uh, what does the future hold? As I said in the beginning, uh, I really feel there's no better time to be a professional in the remodeling industry than right now. 
Uh, sure, there's, there's going to be some bumps along the way. When isn't there, right? Um, you know, we always have the economic cycles that look like a sine wave. Um, we, we, you know, every now and then we start hearing about recessionary fears. Um, we've got the, the post-COVID slowdown, which isn't so much a slowdown as it really is just coming back to normal after a record boom in the industry. Now we're kind of getting a little bit into the normal phase and everyone's kind of going, oh my God, things are slowing down. What's going on? I'm not getting any leads. Well, you know, it's not necessarily that it's that slow, but we've taken a lot of people out of the remodeling market. Everyone, you know, went through that boom phase. Getting, you know, they were stuck at home. Uh, you know, the, the, the wife wanted the, the kitchen redone and uh, happy wife equals happy life. So husband said, yes, man, let's do it. Um, may not have done it before. Fin financing may not have been there before, whatever it might have been. Um, people, home offices, everything really grew from that. Um, but now we, we face some obstacles with that. Um, just like young Alexander faced obstacles uh, in his quest, uh, you too are going to face some obstacles along the way, um, but it, it's the companies that have the, the best leadership, the vision, and it's the execution of your marketing strategies that's really going to help you stand out from your competitors. When it comes to, to, to really being able to build your brand, showcase your company, uh, it's going to really come down to who can create the most success with their online marketing, who can shine their light the brightest, and really outshine their competitors. Those are the folks that are going to really have the success nowadays when others aren't. So I encourage everyone here in the audience, the elite of the industry, to shine your light the brightest and see if you can realize some of those dreams that set you on the path to entrepreneurship in the first place. Thank you to everyone for your time and attention today. It's been an honor.